If you're building a web application, there's some components that need to be running all of the time, such as the server for your website, but there's others which only need to be run periodically. Maybe you're running a nightly job to analyze sales around your different stores and generate a report. Perhaps you need to send out payroll every two weeks. To handle these types of recurring tasks, the cron job is the right tool. Unix systems have had job scheduling utility named cron for decades, so it's only natural that Kubernetes has a utility that enables us to run this type of workload in a cloud native way. Today, I'm gonna to show you how it works. Hi, my name is Sid, also known as DevOps Directive here on YouTube, and I'm a developer advocate working with the channel. If you wanna try out running your own Kubernetes cluster to follow along with today's tutorial, there'll be a link in the description that will give you $100 credit when you create a new account, which should be more than enough to get started. Without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do is to go here on the Cloud Console interface and create a Kubernetes cluster if you haven't already done so. If you have a Kubernetes cluster already, you can skip ahead a few minutes to where we'll dive into the resources that we're gonna deploy. So I'll click Create Cluster. We'll name it Cron Job Demo. Select a region close to us geographically and pick a Kubernetes version. In this case, I don't need much compute power, so I'll choose the shared CPU option and add a couple of nodes using the two gigabyte plan. Click Create Cluster. And now that's gonna go off and provision a cluster behind the scenes. While this is provisioning, let me talk about the Kubernetes components as we build up to using a cron job. We can start at the very base with what's known as a container. A container is going to contain your application code as well as all of its dependencies bundled up into this nice package that a tool like Kubernetes can schedule and orchestrate. This might start with something like a Debian base image. Then maybe you have the Python 3.9 runtime installed. Perhaps you've installed Fast API and SQL Alchemy as Python dependencies to your application. And finally, the source code for your application itself. And these are all bundled up into what is known as a container image, and we can take that image and run it as a container on one of our systems. The main purpose of Kubernetes as a container orchestrator is to be able to take these containers and run them across multiple different virtual machines or physical machines. Our Linode Kubernetes Engine cluster is going to be able to take container images like this and deploy it across a number of different Linodes. Now, the smallest unit of compute within Kubernetes is what's known as a pod, and a pod can have one or more containers within it that are going to share things like a networking interface. So we could have our application container, and then we might have some additional containers that are providing some auxiliary functionality alongside it. To keep things simple though, we're gonna run a pod with just our single container inside of it. Now you never want to run a pod directly within Kubernetes. There's higher level resources that manage pods and give us a lot more functionality. At this point, you might think, okay, let's jump to straight to the cron job. However, there's one intermediate resource that we should talk about before we get there, and that is the Kubernetes job object. Now a job is used to create one or more pods that we expect to run to completion. So if we think of those use cases I mentioned earlier of running some analytics and generating a report or maybe executing payroll, that is a set of work that we will run to completion and then that container would exit and the job would be marked as completed. The nice thing about a job, if the execution of that container fails, the job can detect that and retry it automatically. A job becomes useful when we want to complete some task a specific number of times and track those completions. And now finally, we can move on to the cron job. Now the cron job essentially takes that concept of a job and allows us to apply a schedule to it. So we'll take that same template that we're using to provision the job, associate a schedule where let's say we wanna run it hourly or daily or monthly or at a specific time. And now we will create that cron job, which in turn will create the jobs and finally create the pods so that we can have periodic execution and tracking of completions across our different workloads. So let me jump back over to the Cloud Console and grab the credentials to our Kubernetes cluster. We can see that our three nodes are now running and I'm gonna download this kubeconfig file from the interface here. I'll put the kubeconfig file into my working directory. And now note, this file provides admin access to your cluster, so you wanna protect it accordingly. Don't worry, I'll be deleting this cluster after the demo today which is why I'm not worried about showing the token on screen. In order to use that kubeconfig file, you'll need to have kubectl installed. The Kubernetes documentation at kubernetes.io slash docs provides instructions on how to install kubectl on various different operating systems. With kubectl installed, I can point it to that kubeconfig file to access the cluster. In order to do that, I'll export 
the environment variable kubeconfig all caps and point it to my present working directory slash cronjob demo kubeconfig.yaml. Now if I do kubectl get nodes, we can see the three little nodes in my cluster running. Let me now pull up the YAML definition file for a minimal pod that we'll use to build up to a job and then a cron job. In this case, I've defined only a minimal subset of the different configuration options that are available for a pod to showcase the functionality that we care about. There's a number of other options we can specify. For example, for each container, we might want to specify how much CPU or memory it's allowed to use. Uh, we could add associated metadata with labels and annotations. I wanted to keep things simple for this example. You should be aware of all these different configuration options that you might want to apply to configure your application accordingly. Now, this specification has a number of things within it. Let me just walk through it quickly. First, we specify an API version. This is the API version within Kubernetes where the pod resource lives. So this belongs to the v1 API. It is of kind pod, because that's what this resource represents. We need to give it a name. In this case, I'm just calling it my pod. And then we need to give it a specification what this pod should contain. We'll have a listing of one or more containers. As I mentioned, a pod can have one or more containers. And then within that, each line item in the list, so line 7 through 12, in this case, define a single container. The name of the container itself is my container. I'm using an, a public image called BusyBox. And by not specifying a tag, it will just use the latest tag. If you're defining this for a production application, you would want to specify a specific tag so that this image doesn't change behind the scenes when the upstream project updates. You would also likely define your own Docker file and build and push that image to some container registry. But here, I'm just going to use this public BusyBox image, which is a, an image containing many Unix utilities. And I'm going to pass it the following arguments. I'm going to execute a shell with the command such that we will print the current date. And then this message, hello from the Kubernetes cluster. We provided a restart policy that says, if this pod fails, please restart it. Otherwise, do not. And the reason for this is if we don't provide a restart policy, the default value would be always. And what always says is if the pod terminates, regardless of the reasoning, please restart it. And so what would happen is we would execute the shell. It would print this line. It would exit. And then Kubernetes would see that and try to restart it. In this case, because we're using this to represent a discrete chunk of work that should be completed, uh, we only want to restart if something fails. So instead of always, we want on failure. Now, in order to get this pod to run within our cluster, we can do kubectl apply dash f and then pass it the name of our file. So in this case, it's zero underscore pod dot yaml. Great. If I now do kubectl get pods, we see one pod was in the cluster. Zero of one are ready. It's because it already executed, as we can see in the status, showing that it's completed. We can print the logs of that pod. And we should see the date time of when it ran, as well as that message. So I'll do kubectl logs and then the name of my pod. And we see it output that date time and then the message. So that's a single pod. Let's now build a job associated with that pod. This is the YAML associated with the job, but I've actually put together an animation that shows how the pod definition evolves to make this job definition. So first, we have that definition of the pod that we had. And now you can see the majority of the definition remains the same. However, it shifts under the spec, under this template key, because what the job is doing is taking that template for a pod and creates one and tracks its completion. So we've changed a few fields. We've changed the API version because job lives under batch slash v1 instead of v1 directly. We've changed the kind because now we're creating a job instead of a pod. I updated the name just so I can track it easier. And then we saw that pod definition shift from being at the root level into this template level within the YAML definition. So let me create this job within the cluster. Again, it's just kubectl apply dash f. And then we'll give it the name of the file, which is one underscore job. I can do kubectl get jobs to see it list out this job. In this case, it has the name I provided. And we see that I've asked for a single completion, and it's executed that single completion. Now I can do kubectl get pods. 
and we see my original pod here that I created before, and then the job created and managed this pod with a random suffix to execute the work within it. Once again, we see it is completed. That completion was tracked in the job object earlier. And so because we only asked for a single completion, which was the default, the job is considered done. Once again, I can look at the logs and see the date time when it ran and the message associated with the pod. Now let's take one more step up to the cron job resource. Let's use that animation to see how things progress. We've got our job resource defined here. The bulk of that job resource shifts over. And again, now we have a job template key in our YAML. And so the job that we defined before is now a template that the cron job can use to create one each minute. And the main differences, again, we shifted the kind because now we're no longer representing a job, we're representing a cron job. I renamed it just to make it clearer. We've also added this schedule string, which is using a format known as a cron string. I always have a hard time remembering the exact syntax and how to use it, but there's a great website at crontab.guru that provides a both an explanation as well as a live editor you can use to tweak things and figure out exactly what the cron string schedule means. So in this case, it has an example of five, four, star, 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 and that says that it should run each day at 4.05 in the morning because the first character represents the minute within the hour it should run. The second one re represents the hour within the day it should run. The third character represents the day within the month it should run. The fourth represents the month within the year. And the fifth represents the day of the week. And so we can use this to define all sorts of different schedules. The one that I had used was star divided by one, star. And so this says run every minute. Let's say we only wanted to run it every day at midnight. So we can put a zero here and then we can put a zero here. And that specifies we should run each day at the time 0000, which corresponds to midnight UTC. And generally, these cron strings are referring to the UTC time zone. And so take that into account if you want to run it in a particular time in your local time zone. So definitely check out this website as you're crafting your cron strings or just trying to interpret a cron string that you find in the wild. And hopefully that'll help you understand how to specify the exact schedule that you want for your particular workload. Now let's go back to our definition and apply this to the cluster. Again, we use kubectl apply f and we pass it the name of our file, which is two underscore cron job. And now we can do kubectl get cron jobs. We see it here with our schedule defined. The last schedule field though is none because we created it and it hasn't passed that first minute. Once a minute passes, it will schedule a job, which will schedule the pod and execute our workload. I can run the watch command and see every two seconds, it's gonna execute that kubectl get jobs command. We see my job from earlier, but once we pass the top of the minute, we should see a new one called my cron job dash and then a random string. There it just popped up. As we can see, the job, which is managed by the cron job, has the name of the cron job followed by that string, which encompasses the time in which the, at which the job was created. Now, if I do kubectl get pods, we see my original pod that I created directly. The next one is that pod that the job created. And then finally, the pod that the job that the cron job created. I'll do a watch command on this. At the top of the minute, should see an additional pod come online associated with a new job that that cron job has scheduled. You can see right when that first job reached an age of 60 seconds, another job was created. It ran to completion and then exited. And so while I used this public container image and passed a command directly, you could imagine this being a container image that you've defined containing your specific workload and providing the exact schedule upon which you want it to run. This will enable you to run any type of periodic workload within your Kubernetes cluster and have the system manage and track the completions of those workloads. Hopefully this gave you an idea of what a cron job is, how to use that concept within your applications as you deploy them onto Kubernetes. If you want to learn more about cron jobs, I would suggest checking out the official documentation, which will provide examples as well as any limitations or nuances around how cron jobs behave within Kubernetes specifically.
If you have questions associated with cron jobs and Kubernetes, feel free to leave them in the comment section below and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Also, if you wanna learn more about Kubernetes and running your workloads on Linode Kubernetes Engine, take a look at some of the other videos on this channel where you'll find a wealth of knowledge about Kubernetes and associated topics. That's it for today. Take care.